Buongiorno, eh, sono Sergio Pecorelli, rettore dell'Università di Studi di Brescia eh, e eh, è per me un eh, vero piacere eh, dare inizio a questa eh, quarta puntata di Noi e la Società. Eh, questa volta eh, abbiamo eh, un, un ospite che eh, viene eh, del Procero, eh, abbiamo con noi il giornalista eh, Petrocchi che eh, come sempre eh, introdurrà eh, e eh, farà domande eh, su eh, un tema eh, estremamente importante. Questa volta ci siamo eh, rivolti proprio nel campo medico, eh, ci siamo rivolti anche eh, verso patologie che sono delle eh, patologie eh, che rappresentano eh, purtroppo una delle cause più importanti eh, da un lato di morte e dall'altro anche eh, di eh, cattiva salute eh, delle persone. Eh, credo che eh, questi, eh, questi eh, incontri eh, possano servire davvero eh, a farci pensare, ma a farci pensare soprattutto ad una cosa importante che non è soltanto sullo stato delle cose, ma soprattutto su quali prospettive e come noi possiamo meglio aiutare il mondo ad andare avanti, ad andare avanti nella ricerca, ad andare avanti nelle soluzioni dei problemi, eh, grazie anche a delle tecnologie eh, e alla scienza che sono avanzate in un modo veramente straordinario, ma se noi eh, non ne approfittiamo nel modo corretto, incanalandole anche eh, verso un sistema eh, equo, eh, indubbiamente eh, andremo incontro a delle problematiche ancora maggiori. Per cui ringrazio eh, veramente eh, i partecipanti di questa, eh, di questa edizione e eh, lascio eh, la parola eh, prima al professor eh, Roberto eh, Savona che introdurrà l'argomento e poi darà il via libera bene, ai, eh, sia all'intervistatore che all'intervistato. Grazie, eh, grazie per essere intervenuti a questo intervento. Due parole per eh, fare il quadro del profilo di Roger Stein. Eh, Roger è Senior Lecturer all'MIT di Boston alla Sloan School of Management e ha anche una posizione eh, al laboratorio di ingegneria finanziaria sempre all'MIT. Eh, si è da sempre occupato di tematiche attinenti alla gestione dei rischi finanziari, eh, passando parecchio tempo nell'industria, quindi eh, esaminando eh, le richieste del, eh, dell'ambiente operativo eh, in campo finanziario e proponendo anche degli applicativi eh, poi eh, commercializzati eh, nel mondo eh, finanziario. Da qualche anno... Roger ha iniziato a esaminare un tema eh, che qualche anno fa eh, lo potevamo etichettare come visionario ma in realtà oggi eh, siamo eh, un po' più in avanti perché eh, sul tema che sarà oggetto di questa intervista e che è relativo all'uso della finanza per eh, rendere fattibili progetti di ricerca eh, per la cura contro il cancro, l'Alzheimer, le malattie orfane ma anche le malattie genetiche se eh, qualche anno fa, dicevo, eh, era un'idea anche visionaria, oggi, e è notizia recente, ci sono proposte di legge fatte formalmente al Congresso degli Stati Uniti che sono oggetto di, di discussione attuale. Questo è quanto avviene negli Stati Uniti. Eh, con Roger abbiamo avuto modo di ehm, condividere interessi di ricerca per altri progetti e da qualche anno stiamo lavorando insieme su questo nuovo argomento. L'idea è quella di eh, condividere, implementare, eh, generalizzare, l'idea che a breve sentiremo eh, discutere con eh, Federico Petrocchi, anche in Europa questa idea che può avere delle potenzialità eh, rivoluzionarie se applicate non solo nel contesto della medicina ma anche in altri campi dove spesso il problema del sottofinanziamento, in particolare per la ricerca di base, è probabilmente uno dei fattori che ci eh, fanno eh, arretrare anche nel progresso tecnologico e scientifico eh, più generale del termine. Io lascerei adesso eh, il tempo, lo spazio a Federico Pedrocchi per l'intervista.
Grazie e eh, buon ascolto. Thank you, Roger, to be here. Thank you for having me. With us. As uh, Roberto Savona told you, yes, your idea, your proposal, it's really intriguing in something that only a few years ago would have been described as a crazy, completed crazy project. Now, it's, we are close to a, to a law. There is a proposal of law in the United States. I don't want to uh, say more things. Uh, try to describe now the the key point, the core of this strange and fascinating proposal that probably is the only one way that we have to, to face, to cope with the, a very big problem, the big problem that we have when we, I think that we all knew what, what's the process that start from an idea and hand in a drug how many million, billion dollars or euros we have to spend during, through, through this process and how it's difficult because many, many, many situations you don't reach the target. And so it's really impossible to think that a company can afford a process like this easily. Start. Well, thank you uh, again for your interest in this research. Um, and just to clarify a couple of points, um, there are still many people that say this is crazy. So it's not, still <laughs> crazy after all these years. Um, however, we've been very lucky in that uh, a number of other groups have found this to be intriguing and potentially something that's uh, worthy of, of deeper study and, in fact, implementation. And so I'm happy to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, though, is that uh, this is not just my idea. Uh, this is very much joint work. Uh, done in collaboration with a number of co-authors, uh, Andrew Lowe, Jose Maria Fernandez, um, yeah. uh, David Fania. Uh, there is a team that's a, working. A, a number of other folks who are working with us. And this idea actually came about uh, several years ago, uh, maybe, maybe six or seven years ago, when uh, one of my colleagues, Andrew Lowe, who heads up the Laboratory for Financial Engineering at MIT, and I were at a different meeting uh, focused on systemic risk. And after that meeting, we went to lunch, and we started talking about um, various types of health issues. Uh, in particular, we talked about cancer. For both of us, cancer was a very interesting uh, topic for personal reasons. And Andrew suggested that he had uh, learned that uh, developing new cancer drugs was extremely expensive, uh, but it was also very hard to do uh, because of the financial profile of these types of investments. Um, a new cancer therapy, from the time it's in, as you say, the test tube, let's say, in a lab, maybe it seems to be effective with uh, primates, with, with uh, chimpanzees, or with, with uh, rodents, with, with mice. In order to get that idea, that, that drug that's showing a little bit of scientific efficacy in the lab to be delivered to patients, it takes about 11 or 12 years. Um, most of the drugs that start that process don't finish. Uh, the success rate for a drug from the preclinical, late preclinical phase to, uh, to approval is just over uh, 1 in 20. It's about 7%. Again, it takes about uh, 7, uh, sorry, it takes about 11 years, 11 and a half years. And uh, as of the last count, the cost was about 2 to $3 billion. So when you look at these drugs individually, they're just not attractive for most investors. And most of the financing has actually come from venture capitalists historically. And what we learned was that venture capitalists, as, as savvy and, uh, and aggressive as they are in investing, just don't have, in, in total, sufficient capital to fund all the many ideas and many projects that are currently being developed. Um, so we started to look at this problem and thought about how we might transform the investment proposal from one that was very risky, a one in 20 chance of success uh, with a very high price tag, to something that might be more attractive to pension funds and uh, insurance companies and other types of institutional investors. These are investors that don't typically invest in this type of research because it requires a lot of effort up front and it's also, again, very risky. 
So uh, together we started this program of research, and we involved a number of other of my colleagues. And after several years, we developed uh, both mathematical and computer simulation models that allowed us to look at what portfolios of these investments might look like. So that rather than investing in one or two of these assets, an investor might be able to invest in dozens of these assets. And in so doing, something very interesting happens. Some of the things we've learned about modern portfolio theory that's used every day, for example, for managing stocks and bonds, could be applied with modifications to this very, very unusual investment class. And uh, we showed that, in fact, that could happen. We showed that we could reduce the level of risk to one that would be attractive to uh, institutional investors, and that, um, that the amount of capital required, depending on the uh, specific type of diseases we were looking at, could be reasonable. We also showed that you could use debt to finance a portion of this. And that's very interesting because there's a very active market in fixed income securities. And that's something on the order of $100 trillion uh, currently globally versus the $300 billion or so that's the, uh, the private, uh, sorry, the uh, venture capital market. So we thought there's a huge opportunity here. And that's really where the research started. Over the next several years, we did research in a number of different areas. Uh, we showed, for example, that government guarantees can be very effective. We extended our research beyond cancer to look at things like genetic diseases. Uh, and we did a number of other studies. Uh, most recently, my work has shown that um, we can actually use this type of an investment to reduce the cost to patients of uh, specialty drugs for things like orphan diseases and so on. So we think it's a very active area, a very wide area, that's only now beginning to be fully explored by, uh, by myself and my colleagues. But we've also had some very good luck commercially uh, with other folks that are trying to implement these ideas. Um, so it's quite encouraging, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us something more about the strategy. You, you think that the f to, to have a fund that invests, for example, in 120, 150 research at the same time, and this is the solution because you have many, many research and you are thinking that at least seven, six of these research could, could reach a good target and that's enough to, yeah. to, to balance the economic component. This is the... So it's a very, uh, it's a very tricky kind of a, um, uh, a problem. So again, you've got these very low success, uh, low probability of success projects. However, um, these projects, when they do succeed, tend to have very high payoffs. You have to wait a long time, 10 mm. years, to get the payoff. Mm. But when the payoff comes, it's, it's many times more what the initial investment was. Mm. Um, and so in general, we could say the average return between the zero and the very high one is moderate. It's pretty good. Most investors would find it attractive. It's the risk component that's uh, where, the, where the concern is. And so what we found was that we were able to use some of the mathematics that we developed mm. for other asset classes and determine how we could do things that we call, for example, time tranching, timing the sequencing of the cash flows, that we could use very structural elements, reserve accounts, and these types of things that we've used in other asset classes. And that by doing this, we could, in fact, diversify the risk across many different mm. projects. And that, as you say, one or two successes seems to pay for much of the uh, the cost of development. Now, these projects are a little bit different than a typical stock or a bond. Um, when you buy a preclinical, rights to a preclinical compound or a company that makes a preclinical, for example, mm. cancer therapy or candidate cancer therapy, um, the process involves to get that therapy turned into a real drug involves many series of testing, a phase one testing where the drug is tested to see whether it has any adverse side effects that make it un unusable. Um, there's testing after that to see if the drug actually does what it's supposed to do. Hmm. If it's a cancer drug, does it make tumors smaller? Or does it make uh, a growth slower or something like that? And then finally, there's this third phase called phase three where drugs are tested to determine whether they're better than what's currently available. Most doctors wouldn't want to prescribe something that's not at least as good as what they can currently hmm. prescribe. So all of this testing takes place, and at each phase, two things happen. One is the drug becomes more promising, so it's less risky. Its value goes up after it succeeds in each one of these phases. 
But the other thing that happens is that you need to come up with more money. Each of these phases become more and more expensive. Mm. And so you have to keep feeding the drug in order to get it to, uh, to continue to be able to advance. Now, this combination of the value increasing but yet demanding more capital is a bit unusual. You don't usually think of buying a bond and then having to pay for it again in three years and pay for it another time in four or five years. But that's how this works. And so a lot of the, the action in this particular approach involves figuring out how to budget for that and how to capitalize mm. that in, in a good way. But what we find is that when we do diversify this way, that the, the small number of successes do offset the many um, challenges, uh, the, the, the drugs that don't succeed. And we also find that the number of compounds, you mentioned a number like 120 or 60, depends critically on the properties of the underlying medicines. Mm. It depends on, for example, the success probability, the likelihood of success. It depends on how large trials have to be and so on. And so we can analyze all of this, and very often we do that with simulation because it's very, very complicated interacting processes. And then we can determine what the likelihood is that the structure will have enough capital to pay back bondholders, that there will be enough capital to produce a good return for investors. Hmm. You know, in particular during these years, when, when we talk about financial tools, uh, <laughs> we see uh, we have a terrible image of a, of a world in which everything can happen with no rules. In, in which way is your proposal, it, it's a fund, investment fund, in, in, in how this proposal can be far from the turbulence of this, can stay far from the turbulence that we have permanently in this area? So I think that there, it's important when we talk about financial instruments to talk about the goal of the financial instrument uh -huh. and then the way it's implemented. So the goal of most financial instruments, uh, innovative financial instruments, is to find new ways to reallocate some scarce resource. In some cases, that's time. time. You know, there's a very long-term investment, but investors only want to invest for a short period of time. So we figure out ways that we can move the cash flows around that mm. satisfy the early investors, but also allow for, for future investment. In other cases, it's risk. There are people that are more comfortable bearing certain risks mm. than others. Mm. And so the question is, how do you reallocate risk and so on? And so there's nothing inherently problematic about doing that. Most instruments that we have today, if you go to a bank for a loan, mm. you know, you're doing both of those things. You're, mm. you're, you're reallocating time. You need money for a long time, but you mm. need it now. Mm. Um, it'll take you a long time to pay it back. And also, you know, a bank is trying to decide if the risk that uh, you present as a borrower is sufficient, and this is very important, when they view it within the context of all the other risks the bank is taking yeah. in a diversified way, is it sufficient that they can find a coupon rate, a, a, an interest rate that will be attractive. So there's nothing inherently wrong with any of those things. Mm. They're actually generally considered good things for you know, uh, capital formation, for uh, attracting capital to industries mm. and so on. And I think that where there are historically been issues recently, historically going back hundreds of years, um, have been when those instruments have been used in a way that maybe they weren't intended to, or sometimes they were used in ways that didn't necessarily um, explore the risk potential of the underlying assets in different ways. One of the things that we've advocated quite strongly in the re research that we've done, and that's frankly being implemented by those, um, those folks that are currently implementing these types of things, is very strong governance. Mm -hmm. um, Early in the days when we first started talking about this idea, uh, my colleagues and I had a number, a very long list of here are all the things we have to be wary of mm -hmm. if we really want to make this work. None of us has any interest in seeing this implemented in a way that causes more problems because yeah. we think the opportunity is great mm -hmm. and that if there are early problems then that will mm -hmm. kind of short circuit the, the potential. However, um, we would have this very long list and the the thing that always concerned me the most was this notion of governance. Oh. Um, my fear was that if I would start a fund and I'd say, you know, I'm going to raise $3 billion to invest in cancer research, that there are many, many people who would go out and get a white lab coat and put something blue in a test tube and come and say, this is the next thing. I need, a, I need money to fund it. And I would have no, I'm not a scientist. I'd have no way of figuring that out. And I worried about this a lot for many years. 
But recently, I've seen some groups come together that I think have addressed this very smartly. There's a company called Bridge Bio in California, um, and Bridge Bio has put together a, uh, a team of advisors that are experts in medicine, they're experts in drug development, and they've spent two or three years looking at the science for a specific area of disease called uh, monopenetrant uh, genetic disease, mm. which uh, monogenic penetrant disease, which is um, a disease that's focused on one specific gene in the genome. They're often rare diseases. And they've spent many, many years figuring out which are the most investable of these, and they've got scientists with lots of experience developing drugs. With a team like that, I'm less worried about someone coming up with a blue test tube and saying this is the thing that you should mm. invest in because it's a good screening process. And I think governance is very important. And so mm. some of the other groups that I work with that are looking to do various types of documentation spend a, a, you know, what some would say is an inordinate amount of time describing exactly how investments can be made, what types of investments are considered yeah. fair and not. And so. Okay. So you are thinking to a fund that is completely dedicated to this project? That, mm, I think the, that there are a number of different approaches. And I think that the key that drives you know, the assets that are selected is really three things. Mm. Uh, the first is, where is the need? Mm. You know, where is there, where can a, a structure like this, combination maybe a fund with some debt, mm. where can the, the, that type of uh, structure drive mm. investment to areas that we might not otherwise see it? That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, where is the science strong enough? Uh, mm. There are certain areas where we uh, we don't believe that something like this will work because the science is not yet well enough developed. A colleague of mine, Andrew Lowe, uh, a couple years ago did some research on Alzheimer's disease. Mm. And the determination was that for Alzheimer's, the science is not well advanced enough yet uh, okay. to allow itself to be funded in this yes, way. No, no. And the third thing is, you know, what are the properties of the actual projects? Mm. Um, in the case of uh, genetic disease, the sort that Bridge Bio is following, and by way of disclosure, I do have a small investment. Oh, for me, it's a big investment. For them, it's a small investment in Bridge Bio. Um, I believe in, if, if I'm asking everybody else to follow this, I should put my own money in as well. But Bridge Bio is very focused on diseases that naturally lead themselves to diversification mm. because they deal with a single gene. Mm. So they can be managed for diversification. As a result, much smaller portfolios are possible. Mm. But in that case, you wouldn't be focusing on one disease, you'd be mm. focusing on many diseases. Mm. Mm. Other projects may decide to focus on very specific areas of cancer and, and other things as well. Mm. And by the way, there's no need to restrict this to medical problems. There are lots of problems in science that are characterized as requiring you know, long-term investment up front mm. with uncertain but yeah. low probability payoffs, mm. but very high payoffs yeah. to outcomes. Mm. Any project of that sort could be managed in a, in a structure mm. like this. I was asking you before that, that you are thinking to a fund that's, by a financial point of view, it's completely closed and dedicated to, to cancer. But it's not that we, we can't have a fund that uh, diversify its investment. It must be completely dedicated to, be, to have a governance that, no, or not. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I think that um, that's... That's, again, really a question of, you know, the environment. I, you know, as a financial economist, I'd always suggest diverse, more diversification is better. Yeah. Um, diversification is the one thing that's free yeah. in, in finance. But it's risky uh, sometimes. You can, you, can always, you can always get, you can always find a trade that diversifies for you that's less valuable for somebody else. So it's always good to diversify. Uh, diversifying in some disease areas is harder than others. In genetic disease, mm. orphan diseases, it's easier. For some forms of cancer, it can be more difficult. Mm. The, the nature of the assets and the degree to which they can be diversified and their baseline you know, probabilities of technical success affect the amount of capital that's required. Ultimately, we want to get to a level of diversification mm. that, that reduces the idiosyncratic, the, the project-specific risk. Mm. And what we find is, for example, in cancer, that requires, as you say, you know, tens uh, 60, 70, 80 projects, mm. maybe 100 projects. And that's challenging for two reasons. One is it's very hard to manage mm. 80 projects yes. uh, you know, in a portfolio. But also, it's very expensive to raise enough capital to get to that level of diversification. Our estimates suggest that you need $3 billion, $4 billion, $8 billion mm. to get to a, a diversified uh, portfolio for 
pure you know, cancer research. In the genetic disease space, it's quite different. Um, the success rates are higher. The treatment that those diseases get from a regulatory perspective is better. The sizes of the trial are smaller, less expensive. So for genetic disease, you can get the same level of diversification, same, you know, similar or better sharp ratio, risk to uh, return, re return to risk uh, reward, um, uh, sorry, risk to reward ratio that you would get with the cancer stuff with all of those with a very small portfolio with genetic disease mm -hmm. of maybe a dozen or two dozen diseases, and it might cost only two or three or four hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons that many of the groups that are starting to work in this area are focused on rare diseases, and in fact, uh, a bill has been introduced in Congress that focuses on this research using uh, rare genetic diseases as the first uh, target. The reason for that is it's much easier to get started because you can get better diversification, yeah. and you can also get um, uh, much lower capital requirements, just make it seem less daunting. Mm -hmm. You are talking about rare, rare disease, yes, that probably are, rare diseases are really far from economic balance. Uh, but now, now we are discovering that making research on, on rare disease, you can get some interesting uh, tools for working in other diseases. So in that way, it could be possible to have a, an economical balance? That's actually very interesting because, as it turns out, if you review the medical literature on success rates for orphan diseases, for rare genetic diseases, they turn out to actually be higher than for most other, uh, mm. most other diseases. So for example, again, we talked about cancer, there's uh, you know, about one in 20 probability of success from the test tube to the patient. For rare diseases, that number is actually closer to one in five, about 20%, 19% or so. So the reason for that is that with genetic diseases in particular, very often the scientists already know what's causing the disease mm -hmm. and they have to figure out how to fix it. With cancer, for example, very often you have to first figure out what's causing the cancer to grow and that's a lot of work. And then once you figure that out, you have to figure out how to target it. When you do target it, there are often many different pathways that have to be targeted. Mm. With genetic disease, one, one gene has to be flipped on or off, and now it's not easy, don't get me wrong, but that, that's half the problem as opposed yeah. to the, the full problem. The, uh, the issue with genetic disease, though, is that the population sizes that are likely to, for the rare genetic disease, likely to benefit are very small. In the United States, the definition of a uh, an orphan disease is a disease that affects fewer than 200,000 people in the United States. It's a very small population. But many of these diseases actually affect children uh, under the age of five. So the impact of, of, of finding therapies for these diseases is very great, <coughs> particularly for society. It turns out, uh, as we're discovering, that for certain rare genetic diseases, it's actually more economical to do the research um, because the populations are well known, uh, there are very often patient registries, the trial sizes can be much smaller because you can identify specifically those patients that will be impacted and so on. And as a result, there's been a resurgence in interest in, in genetic uh, disease research, and in particular, recent developments in genetic sequencing and such have really accelerated that. And those are the areas where we do see you know, it is a therapy developed for one disease that then has generalizable properties and after it's approved can then be applied to, to other diseases. And, and this is an area that's, you know, unfortunately a very target-rich uh, domain. Uh, there are about 7,000 orphan and rare genetic diseases of which about 6,000 currently don't have any therapies in development. So there are many, many areas of, of great potential research that can be helped if we can find a way to fund some of that research. But we are talking about cancer, Alzheimer, rare disease, but in general, do you think that this could be applied to many other pathology that, um, yes, we, we have drug for this pathology, but it could be possible to have better drugs. In general, do you think that's it's possible to extend your strategy to many other 
I, I think the answer is uh, conditionally For, yes. Yes. Uh, so I think that um, I think that there are many, many, many domains, both within medicine and mm. science and engineering and so on, where the idea of being able to pool together a bunch of individually very risky um, projects mm. that have high outcome mm. when they succeed but are very unlikely to succeed. Mm. This, this notion, I think, is, is generalizable. Mm. There are areas where I think there are better tools for certain problems. So one thing that um, colleagues of mine at the University of Brescia and I have begun to explore is the notion of trying to apply financial engineering to um, problems involving, for example, vaccination. There are many parts of the world uh, where uh, vaccines are not available for commonly occurring diseases, but for which we have vaccines. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues is that it's, there's not a lot of uh, financial incentive to, mm -hmm. to these vaccination programs because many of the vaccines are now off patent. Um, these are populations that generally don't have a high economic paying ability and so on. And so in that setting, this type of a, an approach taken as is, isn't really going to be very effective because the incentive is not there for the capital markets investor mm -hmm. uh, to come in. There are other instruments, social impact bonds, for example, that could be very effective in these areas. And so one of the things that we're looking at are, are ways to combine some of these, mm -hmm. these techniques. Um, there are different situations where, for example, we talked about Alzheimer's. There's just not enough, uh, there aren't enough projects available mm -hmm. to get to the diversification level that you need, or the projects are at too early a stage of, of research uh, to be practically investable. Mm -hmm. and in those cases, again, we think that uh, someday our approach may be effective, but that's more uh, the domain where governments or foundations can play okay. a more active role. That said, there are many, many other areas where you know, there are great breakthroughs that can happen. The science is well enough developed. And um, the ability to structure a portfolio comes down to just the, the economics of you know, what level of diversification is required and how much capital is required to get there. Mm -hmm. I know that there is someone who is telling you, why don't think to a, a public investment? as an alternative to your fund, uh, because these uh, pathology are, present a, a big cost for the entire society. So for a public investment could be interesting looking in, in the future to invest directly in this research. Yeah, I think that's super. I, I support that 100%. And in fact, we've seen uh, Israel, uh, for example, several years ago, launched something that, that was called the Life Sciences Fund. Hmm. And this was a, um, it was a broader mandate. Uh, it was a public-private partnership. Hmm. And the way it worked, I'm not an expert on this, although I know a number of the folks that were involved in setting it up. The way it worked was the government partnered with uh, private equity and venture capital investors, mm. and they matched, the Israeli government matched dollar for dollar mm. the investment of the private uh, industry. And they also uh, agreed to take, uh, you could call it a first loss, or they agreed that the, the private investors would get what was called a preferred return. Mm. The Israeli government wouldn't take any return until the private investors had at least gotten 5% mm. uh, on their investment. And that fund has done quite well. It started, I believe, at 200 million. It's now at 400 million. And there's talk of doing other um, investments of that sort. In fact, there's recently been, um, I was uh, last March, I believe, uh, at, or maybe it was two, a year ago, March, uh, at a private conference in Israel with the, many of the ministers and uh, some of the private companies to talk about implementing something like what we'd written about as well. Again, we see the U.S. government has introduced this bill called uh, the Rare Disease Act. Um, uh, uh, Congressman Vargas from California, along with one of his colleagues on the other side of the, uh, the other party, uh, the mm -hmm. other aisle, um, introduced this bill in October of last year, and it proposes very specifically the type of structure we've been describing with a twist where the government would provide a guarantee mm. on the debt. Mm. And my own sense is that the government's capital, and I want to be clear, I'm not an expert on governmental policy and governmental budgeting, but from our analysis, and we've written papers about this, it appears the government's capital can be best deployed in two ways. 
The first is for those very, very early stage research that are not yet investable by most, you know, these are researchers that are going on in university labs, in small groups that are still, maybe they've written a paper and they're testing the chemistry or they've written many papers and they're trying things out. But they've not yet gotten to the point where, you know, it's late preclinical. Tremendous role for foundations and government there. But the other role is, I think, um, to leverage the government's investments through, or foundation investments, through guarantees. Mm, guarantee. We've been able to show that the guarantee is a very effective way for the government to deploy capital. As an example, let's say the government had a billion dollars to invest in cancer research. They could do that in two different ways, well, many ways, but two ways they could do it would be to take the billion dollars and give it to each scientist and see what happens. They would have spent a billion dollars and funded a billion dollars worth of research. Another way they could do it would be to guarantee debt on uh, the research-backed obligation mm. structure that we've been talking about, in which maybe uh, $2 billion is raised, a billion dollars of debt and a billion dollars of equity. The government guarantees the debt portion, and now there's $2 billion of, uh, of debt being, uh, $2, $2 billion of capital being invested, mm. all coming from the private sector, in the worst case, if the debt totally defaults, which you know, hopefully would never happen, but there is some small probability that it would, if that debt defaults, the government pays the first billion dollars they're planning on paying. Mm -hmm. But our, our analysis shows that the expected cost of the government is not that billion dollars, but much, much smaller, maybe $50 million. So for the same billion dollars, the government gets $2 billion of investment yeah. rather than $1 billion. And in the worst case, they spend the same amount of money. And so that's another area where we think that the government get involved. Uh, yeah. So I, I, we've been working quite closely, and one of the reasons this bill uh, has come out was because through our conferences and other things that we've done at MIT, we've been able to inter interact and network with government officials and mm. private industry and so on. And finally, tell us something about the law. Why this project need a law? Because if, if I want, if people want to build up a fund like this, they are free to do this. What you ask uh, with a more, with a low So again, I, I just want to start by saying I, I'm not involved in directly in, in the, the, the lawmaking process. Yeah. I, uh, I was down in uh, Washington um, a few months ago speaking with the lawmakers, explaining what we're doing and in a more technical way, and explaining how it would work. And, um, and so we're very supportive of this. In fact, uh, our research is mentioned in the bill itself. Um, and I think what we found in doing this over the last five or six years, we've talked to many, many, many different people. We've talked to lawmakers, uh, legal professionals, uh, scientists, bankers, investors. And I think there are some challenges here that aren't typical for most new investment products. Uh, the challenges uh, really come down to the breadth of um, experience and knowledge that's required in two different ways. Um, the first way is with respect to uh, the science and the finance. This uh, proposal is very unusual uh, from a you know, traditional biofunding perspective, mm -hmm. where investments are made specifically to choose one, you know, one home run, one, you say home run, one goal. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the expectation is that the, the investor is going to spend a lot of time uh, and, you know, analyzing one or a few investments. And we can actually show that in those situations, even when the return on average is expected to be good, it's very likely that the investor will lose their money. And that's just the way it works out. Um, and it's not because the investors aren't smart, it's because they don't have enough projects to, mm. to get that. So it's, diff it's, it's, very, um, it's very unusual from the investor's perspective. And then from the scientist's perspective, it's also quite different. And so investors and scientists, the investors that are used to buying bonds mm. uh, or investing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars at once in a, in a portion of a portfolio aren't the same ones that are experts in investing in the medicine. So that's the first bridge that has to get, mm. that has to get um, crossed. And then even within the institutions that are quite used to investing in the capital markets, we find that those institutions have different groups. There are groups that are very expert in pharmaceutical company investment, bio investment, but they typically don't think in terms of portfolios, they think in terms of individual companies. There are the groups that are very comfortable thinking about portfolios, but they don't usually think about biomedical investing. 
Now, the reason I'm telling you about all this diversity in, in the knowledge base is that an excellent role the government can play is to bring all those parties together mm -hmm. and to give people assurance through their guarantee that yeah. it's, it's, it's a, an interesting area to start to dip your toe in. Supervisor. They provide some, some oversight, exactly, but they also provide, I think, um, a, a catalytic, mm -hmm. a very important catalytic um, application. And, and in fairness, they also get a very, very high leverage on their investment. Because again, they're just providing a guarantee. Mm -hmm. All of the money is coming from the capital markets. Mm -hmm. And so it actually, I think, is a very nice synergy. Yeah. And depending on you know, what the uh, you know, political philosophy is of the group, it's either a way for the government to be you know, actively involved, but by the same token, not to be overly involved. And so I think that there's a, a, big, a big payoff okay. there. We believe that even without guarantees, according to our analysis, these are very interesting and attractive investments. Having a guarantee to get people comfortable is also even better. I don't know if there are questions from the public, from the audience. Uh, on the basis of this idea is that uh, research could be a financial investment. This is, is, is a strange thing because normally we believe that the scientific research is, is uh, paid by public money because it's too risky for everyone. So your idea is how to reduce the risk so to be able to invest also private money in research. And you said, I share the risk among different researchers. One can be the, the gold one that repaid. A few. I hope so. A, a, few, so. a few, we hope, yes. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, and this can be also uh, divided in different fields because you say cancer for just for starting as idea, but you can go energy or mm -hmm. environment or why not? And so on. So good, but but the question is uh, uh, the risk is also in time because you have a, a long time in many of these processes that say to the private, you could have good investment, but very long in time. And this is a type of risk that is difficult to manage. And the second is, uh, which is the selection of the, of the researchers? Because you say cancer. Who select a possible good research? And the third question, and then I stop is uh, how repaid the financiers? Because you said research. Research is not for product, it's not for market directly. It's for knowledge. So how knowledge can repay the investment, which is the mechanism that you think in order to be able to give value, economic value to knowledge? Okay, so I'm going to say back to make sure I understand the questions. Correct me if I, if I say them wrong. There were three. The first question was, um, you know, uh, how do you deal with the long time horizon? The second question was, you know, I've talked generally about how these will work, but practically, how does somebody get their money back? And uh, the third one is, um, how do you actually turn research into money? And so those last two, actually all three, it's really one question. Uh, I'm sorry, selection as well, right. So those three are actually all the, they're facets of the same, the same question. So thank you for the question. Um, the first thing I would say is that uh, one of the important features of the work that we've done is to actually do this tra time transformation. So we imagine um, say an investment going for 10 years. There's one class of investors, though, that would be repaid in three years. Another class would be repaid in seven years. And then others would have a longer term, um, a longer term perspective. Now, clearly, the ones who are paid in three years have less risk. So they're going to have a lower return. The ones that get paid in seven years are taking a little bit more risk. The ones that pay later out. There's also differing uh, security structures. Some of these are structured as debt, where there's a promise to pay a specific interest 
and principal. Others are structured as equity, where there's no promise of any return, except that anything above a certain level all goes to the equity. The projects um, that are typically in these portfolios are characterized by, again, this very unusual profile, which is high probability of failure, long term to find out, and a lot of money required over time. And so what we discovered in our research, and it was well known to people in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, is that there's a period of uh, development that's about six or seven years long, um, during which it's exceedingly difficult to get drugs funded. And that is during the period which is just after the part where you were mentioning you know, the public funds going to, to, you know, to universities and such, where it looks like there's a real idea. It looks like there's some very good preclinical work that suggests that this might work in people. But it's very far away from being determined whether this is a safe drug for people. I mean, there are many things that kill bacteria in a test tube, bleach kills bacteria in a test tube, but if you put it in a person, it's not very effective. It's very, you know, it can cause side effects. And all of this is uncertain at the stage when these drugs are looking for funding. So the goal of many of the structures that we proposed is to bring the, the research from the phase where it's now promising, not just theoretical, but promising, to the phase where a lot of the risk is gone. Typically, that's phase two in the approval process. In phase two, it's very easy much easier to find buyers, either private equity funds or large pharmaceutical companies that wish to purchase the drugs because at that point they often have a one in three chance of success, much better than where they started. So the job of this particular structure is to find enough funding, patient funding, to go for about seven years to get the drugs from this preclinical phase to the uh, other phase. Um, uh, and that, that phase in industry is actually called the valley of death. That's a biblical term for where, where you know, it's very hard to find any, any drugs, uh, any funding, rather. Um, now, it turns out that what you can do with structuring is when you collect the money to, uh, to buy these drugs and you buy them over time, you can budget money in a certain way so that you're relatively certain you'll have enough money to pay for the trials, but also that you'll have enough money to pay back the bonds. And you can also build in very special governance mechanisms that say, for example, as long as there's enough money to keep paying the bonds, we'll keep funding more trials. But if we start looking like we're not going to have enough money to pay the bonds, we'll start cutting back on trials until we can get more money in the, in the budget. And where does that money come from? That money comes from drugs that are being developed that get to be sold. And they get sold as they get more, more advanced. So it's somewhat self-funding, but there's very disciplined budgeting that has to go along with it. In terms of selection, uh, the only method that I've seen that, uh, that seems to work well is having a very, very talented expert panel to do that. By way of just disclaimer, our own research doesn't assume any intelligence. It's kind of funny because you think MIT, artificial intelligence. Our own research assumes no intelligence in the selection process. So it assumes that you're randomly picking drugs and so on. Of course, in real life, you'd have a lot of expertise put against that. So we think of our results to some degree as being a lower bound on what the, the potential could be. This question, ah, uh, Well, thank you very much. I enjoy it very much. Uh, uh, however, I think that uh, uh, there are uh, a few uh, areas in which uh, uh, probably we, uh, you can uh, speculate a little more. Uh, the first one is, uh, the change in speed of research. Uh, today, uh, we know that uh, thanks to bioinformatics, uh, thanks to many other things, uh, things go much faster. Uh, and uh, one fallout of this is the fact that, for instance, if you take cancer, uh, some of the new biologics uh, uh, for drugs uh, for cancer uh, are also, can also be used in other areas, or vice versa. Typical example, or even old drugs, metformins, which was typical for diabetes, now is used for cancer mm -hmm. uh, at very low price. 
So this could encourage more uh, investors, provided, however, uh, that since they want a return, uh, we have to understand, I mean, uh, uh, how this new structure works. However, what I would like to ask you is, what you said is probably more true in the United States of America than in Europe. Uh, not overall, of course, cancer is everywhere. <laughs> but uh, uh, we have a big problem in Europe. And our problem is fragmentation. And what uh, venture capitalists don't want is fragmentation. Uh, so fragmentation means uh, 29 uh, countries or 32 countries with uh, 32 rules. Uh, so regulators and so on, you can imagine, I mean, because each one of them makes its own rule. Uh, then uh, uh, there is another big need, which was raised uh, 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 by Ricardo Petravissa before, and that is uh, the basic research, but with the intent probably of then going to translational research, who is going uh, to pay for it? We say the public, yes, but the public we know, I mean, most of the nations are more or less broke. Uh, so, what I'm asking you, how do you see, coming from a country where this happens, uh, a philanthropic venture capital, mainly for that research? Uh, I think that Bill Gates, for instance, is a, is a typical example, not only for the foundation, but mainly for what they do, I mean, in their lab, mm -hmm. with 800 PhDs that are working for that, and they are completely funded by philanthropy. So this is a really interesting uh, question. Actually, all the questions have been very interesting so far. Um, and the, it's interesting. We did speak with the Gates Foundation shortly after we did our first, uh, our first paper, and I believe just after my TED Talk uh, came out. And we talked to them quite a lot about whether um, this technology that we were developing could be applied to some of their big projects. At the time, they were quite focused on malaria. And they said, can we do something with malaria? And we talked a bit about it, but again, getting back to this notion that you know, there, are, uh, there are certain medications that are well known, but just in short supply in certain areas. And uh, for those types of medication, the pure, the pure version of this model doesn't, we don't think work as well. Again, we're working with some colleagues at Brescia to, to extend uh, that model. We hope, uh, we hope to have some results shortly. But um, so I, I think that the first, we always go back to you know, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And then what is the instrument, or what are the, the you know, financial techniques that we can use to try to solve it? Um, for things like uh, what the Gates folks are working on with malaria, social impact bonds exactly, you know, uh, we feel fit that problem well, and it's a great opportunity for you know uh, philanthropic uh, philanthropic involvement. Our own philosophical view, though, is this: um, when we started our project, we had a very we had a few rules that we said we have to be able to show. The most important was we have to be able to show that even if people don't care about curing cancer, this has to be attractive to them. And the reason for that is that the amount of capital that's available through philanthropic organizations to put to work against certain problems is tiny compared to the amount of capital people have to invest to make money. And we used to joke that when you ask someone for you know, a donation, um, very often they'll give it to you and they reach into their pocket. But they have, it's like the uh, Levi's jeans. They have that little tiny pocket there. That's the donation pocket. <laughs> and the big pocket is where the, the hand goes when they invest their own money. <laughs> so our goal was to make tools and instruments or you know, structures that would be attractive on their own merits. We've deliberately avoided calling this a social impact investment because in people's minds, we believe that when people hear social impact, they think they're giving something up. At least from our own analysis, this is an investment that should be very attractive to anybody, particularly because there are good returns, but the behavior of those returns tends to be very uncorrelated with other types of things in the capital markets. There is some correlation with the valuation of the compounds, but scientific success, the degree to which a certain genetic pathway, for example, 
is going to be a fruitful uh, research avenue is relatively uncorrelated to the level of the FTSE. And as a result, it's a free diversification. Diversification is the one thing in finance that's free. This gives you a nice return that's not correlated with other returns, so it reduces the volatility of your portfolio. This should be attractive on its own merits. Now, if, if philanthropies and uh, foundations wish to get involved, we can see a number of ways they can do that. Um, in the US, for many years, uh, Foundations were very limited in the amount of equity they could buy. Only 5%, I think, uh, of their assets could be invested in, in equity. I think that's changed now, maybe going back. But certainly, you could imagine a foundation saying, we really like this idea. This is an area that's very important to us. We will write a guarantee against our portfolio. If they're not comfortable doing that, they could say, we will buy a subordinated piece of debt that makes the other debt less risky and we'll take a lower coupon than somebody else might. So we're doing philanthropy, but we're also buying debt. Um, for the very, very early stage stuff, I think the only, the only source of funding is public and, and philanthropy. It's just hard to monetize that. Uh, but once you get to something that can actually have a financial payoff, it seems almost obvious that one should be looking to entities that wish to make a financial return and asking them to trade some of their time, the time value of their money and the risk profile for, for that return. So then the trick just becomes making that return worthwhile given the risk they're going to take. And we played with two things. One is getting the return up. The other is trying to reduce the risk through diversification. I think that <clears throat> our time is close to the end. And I have only one final question. And what about sharing information? You have 150 groups. They are a sort of collected groups, and people investing in this big group could ask if the mission is to have drugs solving a problem like that of cancer. Why, why don't share? You should share the information that you get from research. That could be a problem in, uh, in research. In, in some areas, I mean, that is a hot topic right now. You know, there seem to be a lot of silos. And in fact, um, uh, you know, the US uh, Vice President Biden just announced a new database mm. to try to bring together a lot of silos. Yeah. Um, and so there's really two issues. One is purely a, a different form of fragmentation. It's just people are diverse. They report their data in different ways. And, mm. But the other is incentives. I mean, if you've, uh, you're running a commercial lab and you've spent 10 years learning that something doesn't work, mm. That's very valuable to know that, and it's not always clear that you make that fully available. In fact, uh, there does seem to be a problem. I saw a study that suggests that um, something like two-thirds of all trials aren't reported, uh, you know, as they should be or something. I, I don't remember the numbers. Don't quote me on that. But I remember seeing that study and being very surprised by that. A benefit of a structure like this is that you know, with a, s a centralized um, uh, portfolio manager, Provided incentives can be created across the different projects, and that's not easy, mm. but provided the incentives can be created, a lot of knowledge can be shared at least within that portfolio. Mm. And in, in a certain area, for example, genetic disease, that's very valuable. You know, one of the things that I heard over and over again as I would talk to scientists about their funding, I would say, you know, when do you know when it's time to stop research on your project? And almost everybody said, well, we stop when the funding runs out. And, and that's a good thing and a bad thing, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's a good thing because if the, if the reason they're stopping is because they're really onto something hot, that really looks like it's promising, and they run out of funding, we can solve that problem. We can now provide funding through this mechanism. On the other hand, if the idea is, well, we've built a company, and we're doing all this research, we don't want to shut the company down, so we're going to keep trying to get funding and hope that the next thing we discover, that's probably not as fruitful an avenue. And so a structure like this would be more likely to, in fact, stem those types of of problems by understanding that that research is probably not going to work out. And by the way, if, if these guys over here are following the same thing, we might not want to fund them as much anymore either. It doesn't mean that the, that research should stop. It means that you know, for this particular investment vehicle, those researchers will go on to do their own thing somewhere else outside of the vehicle. Okay. So I do think there's an opportunity to do sharing. There are these issues of IP, intellectual property, that have to be dealt with. Uh, we've learned that there are very good ways to contract. Uh, mm. to provide alignment of incentive. And certainly for a specific manager of a, a portfolio, a it's highly incentive, highly incentive to make these rough decisions, these hard decisions in a prudent way.
Thank you, Roger, to have been Thank you very here much. with us. We, we are looking forward for your love because if it will happen to have a love in a big country like the United States, it could be useful for the same process in our countries too. Thank you very much, and uh, I, I, I'd love to see something develop here. I'm happy to help in any way I can. Yeah. I've been doing all my work pro bono. I'm happy to do some of that here as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.